that the supreme personality of God had the original cause of the cosmic manifestation and the super soul within everyone is worshiped. The Lord will be satisfied. There's um, verses like that. Bhagavad Gita, you worship Krishna by your work, right? He'll be happy. Um, Varnashram is pleasing. When we establish Varnashram, it's pleasing to Krishna. So that's the idea. And there is a purport. You're going to put up the purport? It's actually easier for me to read it. Um, I'll read on my computer. It's easier. It is a fact that the government's duty is to see that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is satisfied by the activities of the people, as well as the activities of the government. There is no possibility of happiness if the, gov gov if the government or citizenry have no idea of Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the original cause of the cosmic manifestation, or if they have no knowledge of Bhuta Bhavana, or who is Vishwatma or the super soul, the soul of every one soul. Now I have an argument, because we have learned, perhaps you know, that Northern Europeans' governments are, I don't know, how should we say? Well, most of the people in Northern Europe, the majority of the population in Northern Europe are atheists. Is that correct, Tanya? To your knowledge? And I would assume the governments are anti-God to some degree, is it? Or neutral or more on the side of against? They don't. Anyway, I would assume that seeing that the people are that way, that must have had something to do with their education. At the same time, if you go and look at those countries, you said they're really well run, isn't it? It's clean, people are happy, they're not destroying the earth, everyone has lots of money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, China's an atheistic country, it's doing fairly well economically. It's predicted they will be the number one equal, equal, um, economic power in the future, only to be uh, uh, America will be like three or four, I think three. India will be two, America three. Portugal, better move to Portugal. It's going to be number four. Buy up the land while you can, while it's still cheap. And a country like India where... It's kind of the opposite. Most people believe in God. Uh, it doesn't look like it's managed so well. Of course, there is a difference between managing 6 million people and a billion. That's obviously a problem. Um, but anyway, I'm just saying people will look at this and say, well, you say God consciousness is so great. Now, look at the countries that are where most people are not God conscious. They seem to be doing okay. Um, you could also say, morally speaking, they're doing better or at least equal. So it's confusing. Um, of course, we understand from what Prabhupada is saying here in these verses that if you want to establish God consciousness in a country, you have to establish Varnashram. There's a way to do it. So even though a country may be theistic, it's not Varnashram, neither is it does it necessitate that the theistic people actually act as theists? So, you know, it confuses things, but I just wanted to bring that up because it was brought up to me the other day. And naturally these, these doubts may enter our mind. Now, Prabhupada's point is that the countries of the world are not doing what was done historically in India, and that's why they have problems. So we can't use modern day India as an example. But a God conscious government would be pleasing to Krishna, successful. So even though you have a nice country and things are nice, but Krishna's not pleased with it. So that's not good. So where there's Varanashram, everyone is engaged in pleasing Krishna, right? At least in theory, that's the idea. You organize society in a way that Krishna's pleased. Well, what more? How could it be better than that? Anyway, let's read on. 
The conclusion is that without engaging in devotional service, neither the citizens nor the government can be happy in any way at the present moment. Neither the king nor the governing body is interested in seeing that the people are engaged in devotional service of the Supreme Personality of God. It, basically, they're, um, they're, <laughs> when you're not God conscious, there's so many problems. So you naturally become interested in solving those problems, not solving the causes of the problems. And of course, those problems continue to pop up because the causes are not resolved. So it's kind of natural that, um, and of course, historically speaking, um, the world did change and religion was not uh, due to corruption uh, of the church, of the monarchy. People were fed up with a religious state. They wanted to keep it secular. Make it your own choice. Don't bring it into the government. Prabhupada accepted that, that idea to some degree, but he said it still is a government's duty to ensure that people are God conscious not to ensure which religion they follow. So that's the idea of Varnashram. So Prabhupada didn't buy into the secular state complete, uh, completely, although he did say you can't enforce any particular religion. But to not enforce religion is an abnegation of duty. That's the duty of the government. Consequently, they are becoming more and more implicated in the complex machinery of the stringent laws of nature. People should be free from the entanglement of the three modes of material nature. And the only process by which this is possible is surrender unto the supreme personality of Godhead. This is advised in Bhagavad Gita. In case you don't know, it's not Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavad Gita. It's Bhagavad Gita. Of course, I won't hold you responsible for pronouncing it Bhagavad Gita because even yours truly, none other than myself, doesn't always pronounce it that way, even though I know that's the proper pronunciation. It means a long, a long I and a long A. And the H, which is not Bhagavad, ha, Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. We'll just say Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. Anyway, at least you know, at least you've been told. I've done my duty. I told you how to pronounce it. Where you take that, I have no idea, but at least you know. So if anyone says, Mahatma Prabhu, your disciples do not know how to pronounce Bhagavad Gita, Correctly, Bhagavad Gita, correctly. It's the end of ones in India do. Then I can say, I'm innocent, I told them. They're all fools and rascals, what can I say? <laughs> Stop being a fool and rascal. Wow. You know when, um, you know all the disciples of Narottam Das, or many of the disciples, were, they're great scholars and they all spoke Sanskrit eloquently. And, you know, people were trying to put down Narottam as some, something bogus or not, not in some way not genuine or not knowledgeable or something like that. And then his disciples disguised themselves as shop owners. And then these people came looking for Narottam and they ended up debating the shop owners. And the shop owners, to put it in a colloquial expression, blew their minds with their erudition, their knowledge of Sanskrit and philosophy. And they thought, well, if their disciples are, if his disciples are like this, we, we're not even gonna bother trying to defeat him. So, yeah, Hare Krishna. So wouldn't it be amazing? All Mahatma Prabhu's disciples speak Sanskrit perfectly. Even in Tina you know, says, even in Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita is pronounced differently. Yeah, different. So is Krishna, right? Sometimes we also get confused, which is right. Well, 
you know, because nobody speaks Sanskrit. You you speak your dialect, and so when it goes into your dialect, it's like you know, gets spiced with your own accent. I don't know what the Bengalis say if they say Bhagavad Gita, <laughs> but Bhagav nobody, no, you know, no one, even Prabhupada sometimes pronounce Sanskrit words with Bengali, you know, dropping a dropping the S, Purikit. It's spelled S S H I T, and he would say Purikit, and he dropped the S H. So, um, Dinanath Prabhu, the conclusion is you're all forgiven. We are all, not just you, we are all forgiven for mispronunciation. Krishna knows we're just trying to pronounce the best we can. I'm just trying to get the Russians and Spanish, uh, Spanish-speaking devotees to say Krishna properly. That, that could take me lifetimes. Yeah. And what to speak of Sydney from Texas, we won't even try with her. Get her to pronounce that. There's no, no, it's the Australians. Yeah. Sydney, you could probably do it. The Australians, I don't, I don't know. They're with that accent, Prabhupad, Jai Prabhupad. It, it would be hard to get the A, a to A, ah, because in Sanskrit, it's all, the A's are A, ah, not A. Eh. They say Krishna, Hare Krishna, <laughs> something like that. Anyway, what to do? Krishna is merciful. He knows. Yes, said Krishna is misericordious. Uh, that means Krishna misericordia means he's merciful. Krishna is misery. It's such a weird word, doesn't it? Misericordia means mercy. Like who would think that misery becomes mercy? Whoever established the Spanish language, I need to talk to them because there's some words that just like. Some words that don't work. Yeah, the Russians also. The Russians and the Spanish-speaking devotees pronounce Krishna very similarly. Hare Krishna. Right? Now, if I ask Nadia, say Krishna, she'll say it properly because she doesn't want to say it like a normal Russian. She, she may be trying to like purify herself of Russian samskars. But from what I've noticed is the... Um, Spanish-speaking devotees and the Russian-speaking devotees, they say Krishna um, exactly the same wrong way. But it's okay, because it's what's in your heart that counts, right? Okay, so we can continue reading. Unfortunately, neither the government nor the people in general have any idea of this. They're simply interested in sense gratification and being happy in this life. And so this is interesting because as you well know, when people want to create rationale for doing whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, what do they do? They come up with philosophies to support it, like when you die, it's finished. So if when you die, everything's finished, there's no you to be around to get the karma. So, you know, just do whatever you want to do. Just don't get caught, basically. And don't, you know, try not to hurt anybody and don't get caught. Because you're not going to be around to suffer any karma when you die. So they create these crazy philosophies for sense growth. That's just, just to rationalize, to be able to do anything they want. That, that we have to understand that. That's the nature of consciousness in Kali Yuga. So all these like elevated philosophies, not I can't say all of them, but many of them, they're just rationales for just being whimsical, basically, just do, do whatever I want and give some high flying philosophy to justify it. You know, atheism, you know, a million, a million logical arguments or, you know, all these crazy arguments um, for killing children in the womb. You know, it's just like, just don't make any sense. I just saw something yesterday. It was amazing. They have laws in America, probably in your country. Turtles will lay eggs on the beach or horses will lay eggs. And there's laws that you can't touch them and you will be fined if you hamper, in other words, kill you. If you destroy an egg of a horse or turtle or whatever, um, it's illegal. But if you destroy 
the egg slash child in the womb, it's not. Isn't that interesting? And who knows what kind of crazy rationale they have for that one, but all I can say is, quote unquote, it's crazy. So there's a lot of, have, have you noticed the crazy rationale people have for, for committing sin? You know why they have it? Because the underlying philosophy is, I want to do it, and nobody should stop me. It's a free country. Isn't it, basically? Isn't it? If it feels good, do it. It doesn't matter if it's Shastric or not, or God wants it or not. Well, let's get rid of God. That would solve that. No next life, no God. That leaves it kind of open, right? So just don't get, you know, do anything illegal. And if you do, at least don't get, be smart enough not to get caught. And don't hurt anybody on the way. Of course, you can't avoid hurting people all the time, even if you try. So if we get rid of the next life, if we get rid of God, everything just happens by accident. We're just chemicals. We will go back into the earth as chemicals. Then, you know, you're here. Go for it. Utilize your time for enjoying the body because that's all you have to enjoy. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, materialistic philosophy in a nutshell. Get rid of the next, get rid of the soul, get rid of God, you do whatever you want. That's it in a nutshell. Materialistic philosophy 101, explained in three sentences. You've all just passed the class. It won't take 10 weeks to explain it. And then Srila Prabhupada comes in and <laughs> drops the bomb you know what? You're not the body. Well, that kind of undoes everything that you thought was true and all the ramifications of that, um, which is material life, has just been blown apart. And there actually is a God, in case you, know, you never really understood it, but you know somebody did, somebody is keeping this universe going. There's a devotee who wrote a song long ago. It was an amazing song. I don't have the words, but it goes something like this. I'm such a fool that I'm thinking I'm cool that I think I'm thinking I'm higher than high. And then he goes on, you know, explaining how he's thinking. And then he goes into the chorus, but what if the sun didn't shine? Or what if, you know, what if all these things didn't happen? And what kind of fool am I? You know, I think, you know, I think, hey, you know, I'm just like the best thing that happened. Yeah, well, what if the sun doesn't rise? in the sky tomorrow, then, then what do you do? What are you going to do about that? Like nobody's in charge of that? It's just like, yeah, that's a convenient philosophy. If you want to be God, just it's happening by accident. There is no God. Like, um, and, and that is what the students have to digest in university to get degrees, at least in the field of biology, chemistry, science now. Do you know, I don't know if you know this, did you, do you know that what's taught in the textbooks is sometimes up to 50 years out of date? Did you know that? Like what's going on in the cutting edge of science? You talk to students on campus and they'll argue, blah, 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 blah. And if you're knowledgeable about what's going on in science, everything they're arguing, they have no idea that all the big scientists in the world, except a few atheists, don't even believe it. They're like, they're done with, they were done with Darwin long ago. I don't have respect for him. The neo-Darwinism and neo this and that, they're, scra they're still scratching their heads because they know none of their ideas are like without flaw. But the students still argue with you. It's like, like, why would you want to believe in all that? You know, just because it's on, printed on a page in a textbook. It's unfortunate, right? But uh, in America, maybe in your country also, universities are the sitting places of liberal thinking. And, and conservative thinking is more religious oriented. You don't, don't do whatever you want, whenever you want, whenever you feel like it, because there are principles and there is some accountability to a supreme being, however you want to call it, him or her or it these days, or they, I don't know. God, God's a they actually, rather than Christian. Uh, I was talking to uh, a devotee yesterday, and I said, actually, devotees, we're gender neutral because we don't identify as men or women. So if someone asks you, are you gender fluid, gender neutral, this or that, just tell them you're gender neutral. I don't identify 
with the body at all. I'm not a man, I'm not a woman. I'm also nationality neutral. I don't identify with my country. I'm a soul. In that sense, when we come to the soul platform, you can tell them, well, actually I'm gender female because the soul is female. Something like that. Anyway, you can have fun with them and confuse them. Hare Krishna. All right, we're getting off here. Okay, let's continue reading. The word Nija Sasane, Shashane, in his own governmental duty, indicates that both the government and the citizens are responsible for the execution of Varnashram Dharma. Not just the government, the citizens are responsible. Hmm, interesting. Once the population is situated in the Varnashram Dharma, there is every possibility of real life and prosperity, both in this world and in the next. So, as I was saying in the beginning, we are reading what it was like then. Prabhupada is explaining, here's the blueprint, this is how it should be like. And now, here we are. July 2022, and the world is the way it is. How would this be adaptable in the world today? Well, one way is that we begin in a small way with, a, with our own devotees trying to apply some principles, which we already do in ISKCON, which is already from the beginning, because part of our culture to have ashrams and the four varnas we study understand something about him. We're trying to be Brahmins, live a Brahminical life, clean, rise early, purity, honesty, sense control, and so forth. So they're obviously, even without trying to establish Varnashram Dharma, we have some of the principles. So we start there. And if we build communities, then traditionally in India, the Brahmins live next to the temple, take care of the deities. Then the next circle, Chatras, next circle, Vaishas, next circle, Shudras. It's kind of a transcendental apartheid. I don't know how that would go down in today's world. Apartheid is not a is a very politically negatively surcharged word, but word about that Varnashram is a kind of apartheid. Without any prejudice, without any form of disrespect. But apartheid on the material level is full of prejudice and disrespect. And it um, holds people down. Whereas Varnashram does not hold people down, it just puts them in the classroom they're best suited for. Why? Why aren't you putting me in the 10th grade class? Because you're five years old. That's why. That's not prejudice. You just, this is your first day in school. You're not going to be in 10th grade yet. So it's something like that, right? But it'll be seen as prejudice. Well, it's not fair. You know, why don't, you know, why don't you let the five year old go in the class with the 16 year olds? You know, why deprive him? So this kind of liberal idea is a, that never works. The other thing is that we have a problem in the world today is that there is a natural hierarchy in the world, in nature, everywhere. And when you try to dissolve that hierarchy and make everything one, you can't because it's not the way the world is. And the problem, again, that the reason people want to do this is because they believe these hierarchies become the catalyst for so much evil, so much prejudice and so forth, which I don't doubt. But within the Varnashram system, if done correctly, there isn't prejudice. There's just classification, which is accepted as the best classification for the individual according to their qualification. And you can move up. You can become purified. You can move up, right? In, in the Varnashram system, system, if by nature you're Shudra, you can cultivate bhakti from any position, and you could also gradually raise, be raised to become a Brahmin. Look at ourselves. We weren't even Shudras. We were less. Now look at us. Or maybe we shouldn't look at us. I don't know. That could be dangerous. But um, those of us who are qualified Brahmins, we made it from a very low position. And all of you who are not quite there, you're on your way hopefully. So um, there's no discrimination. It's just like right now you're in fifth grade or you're first grade or kindergarten, but that doesn't mean you can't graduate. So 
So that's the idea. So, um, you know, I think the problem is obvious that you can't legislate consciousness. So there's prejudice in the world. I was telling, I was telling some devotees, some devotees are here. I have three devotees here from South Africa. So we were on a walk yesterday. We were talking about my experience in South Africa because I was there during apartheid. And after uh, I was in South Africa for a year, I came, or a year and a half or so, I came back to America at some point. I was in Mauritius and then India and then England. So it was about two years after I left South Africa, maybe, that I came back to America. And it was very interesting to see America after living in South Africa during apartheid, because apartheid meant we lived in a white neighbor, all white neighborhood that went for miles and miles. And after the curfew of six, no Indian colored or black person was allowed in the neighborhood. And if they were found uh, in the neighborhood, they'd have to have proof that they were working for someone in the neighborhood. Otherwise the police would pick them up and I don't know what they would do, escort them out, put them in jail. I have no, I don't remember. So, and, and so there was an Indian neighborhood. There was a color, colored means you're, you come from a, a white and black parent ancestry. Like uh, Troy, Net was his name, Trevor Noah. He's, that's a colored, you're not dark. You have, a, he has a white uh, parent and a black parent. So you have those four classes and they all have their own neighborhoods. And I came back to America and guess what I saw? The same thing, exactly. It was 1980, I came back in 83 in America. No, actually, actually what I went to South Africa, I think in 1981, and then I had come back to America for some time after being there to, to try to encourage more devotees to come. And, and I was looking at America in a way I'd never looked at it before. And I thought, I was looking at them saying, this is so interesting. The America is exactly like South Africa. They have apartheid. It's economic. It's, it's an ethnic economic apartheid, but it wasn't enforced or in any way, I mean, it was abolished in America, but it wasn't abolished in the hearts of people. So it was so interesting to see, oh, all the black people live over here. If there's a black person walking in our neighborhood in the evening, we will call the police. There's a black man walking in our neighborhood. You know, please come get out of here. You know, there's no law saying he can't do that. There's no law saying he can't live in our neighborhood. Nobody would sell him a house. Nobody would rent him a house or her. No way. So the apartheid was in the heart. So you can't legislate away prejudice. So that's where, why people misunderstand, because in theory, in, and in practice, I assume also, at least before Kali Yuga, when there was Varnashram, it was without prejudice. Nobody was thinking, oh, you're a potter, so you're a loser. They were just thinking, that's what you do. You do it well, and that's what you do, and that's the talent Krishna has given you. And you're classified as Shudra, but that's just so you don't become a professor at the university, because if you're a professor, you have to have brahminical qualification, brahminical intelligence, brahminical purity, brahminical sense control. And if you're shudra, you're not expected to have that. So it doesn't work if you're a professor. So it was just for the smooth running of society, amongst other things, but that's just one point. So um, let me tell you what it was like for me growing up. Um, if I, from my house, went west, all white. If I went north, all white. If I went south, maybe six miles white, and then black and Mexican. If I went east, maybe eight, ten miles east, Mexican, black, right? So it was size for me, there were two directions where it was just white in one direction, basically white and Jewish. So 
we had a lady come to our house once a week and she would clean. Like just, you know, your houses get really dirty. And um, if you have enough money and you're lazy enough, you hire somebody. It's good exercise to actually clean. So we'd hire somebody. Would you like to take a guess what color she was? Um, Blanco, what's, what's in the middle? Blanco, what's middle? What's, you know, kind of like Honorata's color, tan, Blanco, tan or negro? White, tan or black? Who could guess what color she was? Moreno. Moreno, what's it called? Moreno. Moreno. Morello, yeah, she wasn't Morello, she was Negro. And we called her a Negro, she was, ne that was the, yeah, that was the person who cleaned the house. And then we had a gardener, he'd come every week, mow the lawn, pull the weeds, this and that. And he was from the great country of Mexico. I think Mexicans make good gardeners. Um, things may have changed then, but that's what I grew up with. Um, what's in my, what was impressed the some scars I have, Mexicans are gardeners. They also, the Mexicans would come to our house and they would say, we can fix the dents in your car. They actually would come right to your house and fix your car. So the Mexicans are gardeners and fix dents in cars. The black people are the cleaners. And the white people, what are we? We're the ones with the good jobs and education and the money. Hare Krishna. So is that apartheid or is that apartheid? Just no laws for it. But other than, you know. So that's why people, when they hear Varn Ashram, they have, it's like a horror movie for them because they can't imagine having classes without prejudice because the reason, the, out, the, outcome, um, of, the outcome of prejudice is having classes as opposed to having classes as a <laughs> consequence of, of benefiting people. It's not, it's not in their head. So this is, this is a hard, it's a hard thing to sell, isn't it? Because there's no reference point. Isn't this the caste system? You guys follow the caste system. No, there's no such thing as a caste. It's called Varna. No, oh, but you, the Brahmins exploit the people. They exploit the sutras. It's true, they do, but that wasn't part of it. You know, the Brahmins would say, oh, hey, Sudra cast his shadow on me. I have to take bath in the Ganga and the sacred river now to purify myself. Things like that. What to speak of going on a Zoom call with, with full of the faces of Malachas and Yavanas. We have to just keep spraying ourselves, right? Get purified. That's the, you know. All you Malachas and Yavanas out there, I'm showing mercy on you by looking at you. You don't even deserve to be looked at. So that kind of idea. And so then what happened was when the, you know, there's so many rules and regulations and strictures. So if you do something sinful, you go to Brahma and he says, okay, drink hot ghee, you know, walk on hot coals, you know, a hundred Hail Marys or something, much worse than a hundred Hail Marys. And kill yourself, commit suicide, or there's no, there's no reformatory process for you. And so there's so many people became Muslims. Hindus became Muslims because the Brahmins were giving them ridiculous atonements. So that's a long way of saying the whole thing is really messed up. And having said that, I think we can read the next verse. Well, I'll see if there's any, anybody wanted to say something. I have a comment from Mercedes. They actually changed that making abortion illegal. They're forcing a 10 year old to give birth. Right now in Tennessee, I believe, which raised a very high risk of a death. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are issues. Yeah, well, right now in America, the, the abortion thing is, yeah, it's on my mind because it's, it's on everyone's mind. They're trying to remove the death sentence. Yeah, they're, anyway, anyway, yeah, save yourself. Yeah, if it, anyway, it's a discussion, but the general principle is, the general principle is we have no right to take anybody's life, whether an insect or an, 
a embryo. There may be considerations like mosquitoes when they attack you. After they attack, then you can fight back, not before. Of course, then after they attack, it's too late because how you know how will you know they're attacking till they bite? So it's a conundrum, right? But Shastra says you can attack after when you're attacked, you can fight back. But you can't say, well, I knew that mosquito was going to come. Well, he was three miles away. Yeah, but I knew he was coming. Comes every year and gets me. So I just like kill every mosquito I see. Just, you know, like comes out. Kill every child. I'll kill every mosquito I see because one of them could bite me. Well, if, you know, if it's some serious disease, that's that, then you have a right to do that. Otherwise, not till they attack. That's the Shastra. Okay. Anyway, Mercedes, that's a big discussion. Um, but that's the general principle. Your body doesn't belong to you, it belongs to Krishna. You know, you could look at an issue and you could think, okay, what is logically the best thing? What is practically the best thing? What is philosophically the best thing? What is ethically the best thing? Go down the list. Or you could say, what does Krishna want us to do? It would save you a lot of time. And so that's our process. And we know Krishna doesn't want us to harm anyone. But if it's in self-defense, that's different. If it's, uh, of course, that's an ethical argument. Whose life is more important? The babies or the mothers? But um, generally, I, I can't give a Shastric reference off the top of my head. I would say the mother, I would try to save her life first, but I can't say that for sure. That would be a, you know, be quite be kind of a strange life to know that you were born, your birth killed your mother and she made that decision. You might be traumatized. You'd be quite traumatized, wouldn't you? But you know, you know that of course, if the girl was raped, it's another thing. If the, if it was a girl's boyfriend who did it, what's she doing with the boyfriend alone at ten years old? You know. So there's also those considerations. You know, there's always the, you know, <clears throat> the considerations of what to do when a young woman is pregnant. But then there's also the consideration how she got pregnant. Was it consensual? Even if it wasn't, why was she alone with some boy who then lost control of himself? She should have been careful, right? So many things to discuss, which we're not going to discuss because I'm definitely not an expert. And if I say anything else, <clears throat> I don't think it will add anything to the discussion. And um, fortunately, within ISKCON, it's not a problem. It's very rare that this would happen, which is due to Prabhupada's mercy that we have some ability to control ourselves. So let's go to text 20. Tasmans tushne kim apraptam jagatam ishvare share loka sapala ye tasmai haranti bhalim adrithaha the Supreme Personality of Godhead is worshipped by the great demigods, controllers of universal affairs. When he is satisfied, nothing is impossible to achieve. For this reason, all the demigods, presiding deities of different planets, as well as the inhabitants of their planets, take great pleasure in offering all kinds of paraphernalia for his worship. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so we have mentioned before Prabhupada's statement, if you can please Krishna, then what more could you want? Bhagavatam's statement, when some siddhi haritoshanam, all perfection is achieved when you please Krishna. So that's, you know, you know why you're in the material world, don't you? Did anyone ever tell you? Because you want to enjoy instead of letting, making Krishna enjoy. So if you can please Krishna, that becomes the perfection of your life. 
if you can please yourself, that becomes the continuation of the same mentality you've always cultivated. So it's like, you know, if Dinanath goes out and gets this super job and makes all this money, all his friends will go, fantastic, stupendous, you're the, you'll be congratulated, right? For being what? Being a selfish person, you'll be congratulated because that's, that's why we're here to, to get more. So if whoever gets more is, you know, he's in Fortune 500 magazine because he got so much, right? Dinanath in India, these are the, the people that make it big. Rich business owners, athletes, Bollywood stars and politicians. They're the, right? They're the famous people, right? So why did you become a Bollywood star? Why did you become a, start a business? Why did you become an athlete? Okay, maybe you love to do those things. But in general, I don't want to generalize everyone, but in general, we did it because that's what we wanted to do. And if we do it well, we're glorified. Look, he's such a great athlete. But what's underlying the person we're glorifying? Just he wanted to do it so he could be recognized. And also, well, these days, I don't know about India, but these days, if you become a star athlete, you'll, you'll become very rich very quickly. So we, that's what we glorify. Nobody sees that because nobody sees, <laughs> basically. Okay, let's read the purport. All Vedic civilization is summarized in this verse. All living entities, either on this planet or on other planets, have to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead by their respective duties. When he is satisfied, all necessities of life are automatically supplied. In the Vedas, it is stated, Eko Bahunam Yo Vidadhati Kama Kata Upanishad. That means the one is supplying, fulfilling the desires of the many. He's the one and we're the many. From the Vedas, we understand that he is supplying everyone's necessities. And we can actually see that the lower animals, the birds and the bees have no business or profession, yet they are not dying for want of food. I have so many living entities on my property and they're all being fed and not by me. And some of them are big and fat. It's so interesting to see them. We have armadillos. Do you know what an armadillo is? It looks like a, it's got a shell in the back like a hard shell, like an army tank. And uh, it's got a snout, looks like a plumbing device, you know, dig the earth or something. Um, we have, of course, every insect God ever created is, you know, within 10 feet of me right now. And um, that's when I say, when you come to Florida, I hope you like insects in hot weather because you'll get plenty of both. Um, we have, Turtles, about this big. We have all kinds of frogs, like all over the place. The frogs eat the insects. It's kind of gross to watch it, but I sometimes chant my rounds outside at night and the insects are all on the ground and the frogs are there. And the frogs are just eating them, even beetles. And the frogs are only this big. And But the most amazing thing, I think, after you see all the fat armadillos and the fat turtles and like, like, what are you guys eating? And what to speak of all the birds is to see the deer, we have deer. You know, deer, they're not small animals. Like, you know, a, a, small, a small deer is bigger than the big, biggest dog you'd see. Who's feeding them? And then Prabhupada said, what about the elephant? Like the elephant in the wild, they need to eat two tons of food. Who's feeding them? It's so interesting, isn't it? And I haven't seen one deer with a briefcase. Have you? That was Prabhupada's, Prabhupada's point. The deers, the elephants, the tigers, like they, they don't go to the office and somehow they're eating. Like, and so God won't feed you. 
You're worried he won't feed you. He's feeding all of them. You need to work like an ass to get two chapatis and a cup of tea, but they're getting, the elephant's getting two tons of food and he doesn't go to the office. Amazing. It's times like this, I feel like being coming an elephant in my next life. Well, that's, that's why a lot of people look at the animals and go, yeah, I'd rather be an animal. You know? It's got a nice life. You know, French Poodle in Beverly Hills got the whole house to myself all day. You know? And my masters are out at the office working. Yeah, I got the life. You know? Why be a human being? Just be a French Poodle in Beverly Hills. That's okay, but you may not become a French Poodle in Beverly Hills. You might become a Poodle in China and become someone's dinner. So you can't control that. That's why I probably said, just get out. Don't hang around here. Okay, continue reading. Human society, however, has artificially created a type of civilization which makes one forgetful of his relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah, that's the great contribution of modern society. What has modern society done? We've helped everyone forget God. We're, this is like the best thing we could have done. You know? These stupid people believe in God through our science, through our scholarship, through our education. We finally got people to stop believing in God. It's the best thing we could have ever done. Finally, human society is now going to make progress out of the dark ages of religious fanaticism. That's their contribution. Congratulations, guys. You've set the world on a path to hell. And you have no idea what you've done. I'm going to read that again. Human society, however, has artificially created a type of civilization which makes one forgetful of his relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Modern society even enables one to forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead's grace and mercy. Consequently, modern civilized man is always unhappy and in need of things. People do not know that the ultimate goal of life is to approach Lord Vishnu and satisfy him. They have taken this materialistic way of life as everything and have become captivated by materialistic activities. Indeed, their leaders are always encouraging them to follow this path. And the general populace, being ignorant of the laws of God, are following their blind leaders down the path of unhappiness. In order to rectify this world situation, all people should be trained in Krishna consciousness and act in accordance with the Varnashram system. The state should also see that the people are engaged in satisfying the supreme personality of Godhead. This is the primary duty of the state. The Krishna consciousness movement was started to convince the general populace to adopt the best process by which to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead and thus solve all problems. So there's your answer when anyone asks how to solve all the problems in the world and say, we all have to learn how to satisfy the Supreme Lord, Hare Krishna. So it is now, oh, we could read one more verse, unless there's a question here. We have time for one more verse, and then we can take questions and discussions. Are you ready for one more? Can you digest it all? Topics are similar, so I think we can keep reading. It's kind of, Prabhupada's kind of elaborating on the same points. This is text 21. Tang sarva lokha marat yagya sangraham traivayam dravyamayam Tapamayam yagya vichitra jajato vavayate rajan sadeshan anurodham arhasi. Dear King, 
The Supreme Personality of Godhead, along with the presiding deities, is the enjoyer of the results of all sacrifices in all planets. Bhuktaram Jagatapasam Sarvaloka Mahishram. That's right from Bhagavad Gita. The Supreme Lord is the sum total of the three Vedas. The owner of everything, the ultimate goal of all austerity. Therefore, your countrymen should be engaged, excuse me, should engage in performing various sacrifices for your elevation. Indeed, you should always direct them towards the offering of sacrifice. So the, you know, the idea is, as you well know, we are highly qualified at committing sinful activities. Like we were born that way. With all the qual we were born with all the necessary qualifications to commit sinful activities. We didn't have to learn it. We just had that propensity. Right? So now what do you do? Everyone who takes birth wants to commit sinful activities. How does the world go on? It's called religion. That's how. It curbs that tendency and trains people in pious activities or transcendental activities. So, um, so what, we're, we're trying to learn several fundamental things while we're in this body. And some of these things are really difficult to learn. Not to learn intellectually, but to actually learn it as a way of being, as a culture. We are deeply conditioned to 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 a, such a degree that, unfortunately, we are programmed in such a way that everything we see, we think, how can I enjoy it? I'm just stating the facts. This is unfortunate, but it's true. Now, it's possible to see beauty without a desire to enjoy that beauty. That's possible. Right? This world is very beautiful. I can see it but it doesn't mean I think I'm the enjoyer of this world. I can acknowledge, well, this is Krishna's creation. It's very beautiful. You know that story. <clears throat> you must have heard this story. In the early days of ISKCON, it must have been 1967, a devotee, or a group of devotees went to the beach with Prabhupada. They had a sunset tear time. Sunset kirtan means they saw the sunset. Doesn't mean it was on Sunset Boulevard. They, they saw the sunset. The devotee said, oh, Prabhupada, the sun is so beautiful. Who knows what Prabhupada said? I don't want to rain on your parade, but Prabhupada said, if you are attached <clears throat> to this sunset, you will have to come back and take birth again. Because you want to enjoy it. Now, he wasn't saying the sun sunset wasn't beautiful. It's not what he was saying. He was saying, you are, if you are attached to enjoying the beauty of the sunset, you'll have to come back. If you see this sunset as one of Krishna's eyes or Krishna's beautiful creation, and it inspires you in your bhakti, that's completely different. Now, how many of you have seen a beautiful sunset and said, this is so beautiful, I like looking at this sunset? Like how many of you? Like 101%, right? Or this tastes so good, I like it. Or this sounds so good, I like it. This smells so good, I like it, right? Now we take this for granted because this is how we are, but this is actually antagonistic to bhakti. Like Prabhupada said, 
when a man sees a beautiful woman, he should think, oh, she would make um, a nice devotee. Krishna can enjoy her, or she would make a nice devotee. She would attract many men. She could distribute many books, or she would give class. All the men would melt. They'd all move in the ashram just to be with her. Yeah. So you're looking at it, but you're not looking at it in terms of how you would enjoy it, but you're looking at it in terms of how Krishna would enjoy it or how it could be used in Krishna's service. So I have a story for you. I just heard yesterday. Are you ready for a story? This is, could be a, um, unique for you, this story. There was a devotee, maybe a devotee couple in Prabhupada's room. And the woman was very beautiful. Just like Tanya and Anuradha and Gaur Priya and Nadi and Sydney and Gabriella and Danny and Janaki and Kavita and Kamal and Malinina and Ananda, beautiful like them. And Prabhupada did not say this to her, but he said it to another devotee. He said that that devotee, she's very beautiful. Which is kind of interesting that Prabhupada would say that, don't you think? Because if an ordinary man said she's very beautiful, what would that mean? It's like, I'm attracted to her beauty. Step one. Step two, if I could, I would like to enjoy that beauty. Step three, maybe run a kidnap her or marry her or something like that. Well, today nobody gets married, right? Just run away with her. So um, the woman actually heard it. And she said, thank you, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, it was not a compliment. It was simply a statement of fact. Wow, what does that mean? In other words, I was just observing that you're beautiful. Compliment would mean something like, um, I'm enjoying your beauty. Of course, Prabhupada's not, uh, he's speaking in general that a man who compliments a woman for her beauty, there may be something more involved than just an objective analysis, right? So well, why is this important? I look at the, the sun and I say, the sun is beautiful. That's a compliment to Krishna's creation. It doesn't mean I'm going to dedicate my life to enjoying sunsets. When you come to Alachua, we can go to the park and we can watch the sunset and enjoy it. No, we'll go to the park and chant Japa. And the sun may be setting also. So we are so accustomed to enjoying everything or being repulsed by the things we don't like, which is just the same thing. So if you're repulsed, don't think you're advanced. That just means you can't enjoy it, so you're frustrated, and it's kind of obnoxious for you. Doesn't mean your propensity to enjoy is gone. So we're, we're so used to that. And that is 180% antagonistic to the principle of bhakti, where everything is supposed to be for Krishna's enjoyment. Right? She is very beautiful. That's it, objective. That was just a statement of fact. There's nothing, nothing about it. And that's how an advanced devotee sees. So you think, does a pure devotee, does like he look at a house and just go, wow, it's garbage. Does he look at a woman and just go, wow, spit. No, not at all. He might look at a house and go, that's a beautiful house. He might look at a woman and say, she's very beautiful. It doesn't mean there's any desire to enjoy it. It's just an acknowledgement. It's a fact. So I've often said there's a difference between thinking about something and feeling about something. Because you can think, you know, that Ferrari, that Ferrari is that red Ferrari. That's a beautiful car. So Gopinath sees a red Ferrari and he's like, wow. And I say, Gopinath, what's wow? He said, look at that Ferrari. That's wow. I said, do you want one? He goes, no, no, it's too expensive. I don't want one. I couldn't afford it. So he's appreciating that it's an amazing car. But on an emotional level, 
he's actually repulsed by it because he would have to give his whole life to to be able to buy that just to have that car he'd have to like rob 10 banks to pay for it and risk ending up in jail so 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 we are supposed to traverse the world observe it even observe the things that are beautiful and attractive but observe it without the emotional response that this is mine this is for me to enjoy i enjoy this but rather this is beautiful could we offer to krishna for his enjoyment and until we come to that platform the bad news is we get another body because the only reason we have a body is to enjoy and if you have no desire to enjoy why do you need a body what would you do with it right if you have nowhere to go why do you need a car what are you going to do with a car nothing so you don't buy a car. That's the idea. Does that make sense? So ladies and gentlemen, Prabhus, Matajis, when you look in the mirror and you see your body, you can think, this body was given to me because I wanted to enjoy. And if I transfer that mood to only wanting to to serve krishna for his enjoyment i will not get another body because i won't need it it has no purpose it has no function if i want to serve krishna eternally unless krishna wants me to stay in this world and preach and serve him in some way i will get a spiritual body which is designed for that purpose i don't need a material body it's designed for another purpose does that make sense that's the reason we've got the body, because we want to enjoy everything and anything. We have five ways to enjoy it, plus a mind you can also enjoy. So we have six ways to enjoy everything. So only six ways to enjoy the body. The subtle things, like you can enjoy intellectual discussion, creative acts, and pride and ego, that, that's also there. And then the more grosser, the taste, the smells, the sights, the sounds. Uh, and the touch. That's it. You notice how your body is always like, do you notice that? How your senses are always like ready to look at something, hear something, taste something, smell something, right? If you smell a beautiful flower, you can think, wow, I wonder what Krishna's body smells like. If you see a beautiful man or a woman, you could think, I can't imagine how beautiful Krishna must be. Because this person's quite beautiful and they're just like one spark of Krishna's beauty. If you see a wealthy person, I can't imagine how wealthy, how opulent Krishna is. You know, you just, there, you, you, you were supposed to see it that way. So there's no desire, oh, I wish I was wealthy. I'm so miserable. I wish I was beautiful. Then I could get all the beautiful girls. You know, you're not supposed to think that way. Think, wow, Krishna is so beautiful. That's good. Let him get all the beautiful girls. He can handle them. Right, Gopina? It's hard enough to handle one. He can handle unlimited. Let him have them. Without him, I couldn't even handle one. Here's an insider's secret, guys. Women don't want you to marry them to enjoy them. They want you to marry them because they want protection and care and affection. So when you get married and you're thinking, I'm getting married to enjoy them, there's an incompatibility. And ladies, your men, your men like to be served and honored and respected. And so when you get married thinking, I will enjoy them. Yeah, these two people, you know, like two knights in armor fighting because because they have the wrong one, they, they've come with this bob, I'm the enjoyer, right? So when that's, you know, that's what the whole point I'm making is that's what we come to this world with and we're meant to purify it. And that's what Krishna consciousness means, to, to purify that. And it's so deeply ingrained, so obvious to see, yet so subtly placed in our heart it 
it is not easy to understand in reality that everything is for Krishna's enjoyment. I do not exist for my enjoyment. You can write that down, make a tattoo. Everything exists for Krishna's enjoyment. I do not exist for my own enjoyment. And then the culmination of that thought is, but when I exist for Krishna's enjoyment, I experience the ultimate enjoyment, the ultimate transcendental enjoyment. That's the, that's the paradox of this whole thing. When you stop existing to compete with Krishna, on that day, that's the first day you actually enjoy. When you stop trying to enjoy, that will be the first day in your life you actually understand what enjoyment is. Until then, all you understand, you will you will only understand some temporary enjoyment in the mode of passion, mostly passion and ignorance, mixed with all kinds of other troubles. Right? I mean, look at all the trouble Donald Trump is going through just to satisfy his ego, because he can't admit that he lost the election. There's a lot of trouble he's going through just to, you know, polish up his ego. And, you know, I think it's a really good example for us because material life is like that, isn't it? You know, in order to enjoy, you have to go through so much trouble. It's like he's risking his whole life. He's risking God. He risks so much. He was told by people, don't do this. It's illegal. His people are telling him, no, don't do this. Don't try to enter fear with the election, don't talk to these people, it's illegal, and they're just going for it. So he performs so many illegal activities. Whether he'll be charged for them or not, we will find out. But it's so difficult to satisfy one's ego, satisfy one's needs. And it's also funny, because he's so wealthy. Like you'd think with that much wealth, he'd kind of just chill out. No. Because the big, the big carrot after wealth is pride, is fame. It's more, it's a, it's a greater form of sense gratification than wealth. Because wealth is like, you know, once you have everything, it's, you get used to it, isn't it? Krishna designed the world in such an interesting way that no matter how much you get, at some point, that becomes normal. It's kind of like chewing gum. At some point, it's just like, like I have this, whatever it is I have, at some point, it becomes normal. And I have to have that to be normal. And I get depressed if I don't. So it could be a paycheck of a million dollars a month. That, you know, we think, you know, people are making a million a month. No, people are, some people are making way more than that, like crazy amounts of money. That's just their standard. That's what, the, you know, that's normal for them. They need that. We can't imagine you know, a million a month. I'd take a million a year. I'd take a million in 10 years. That's how we're thinking. And this person's like a million a month's not enough. It's not making me happy. Like, how did that happen? <clears throat> So Krishna, he's so clever and so merciful that he makes it impossible to be happy in the material world, ladies and gentlemen. Take my word for it. You can't do it. Don't try. You're wasting time. Krishna has already made an arrangement. Okay. The conclusion is, if you become rich and famous, Use it for Krishna. Don't you, if by karma you become rich and famous, use it for service. Don't use it for sense gratification because that money and that fame will create misery unless it's used in Krishna's service. And Prabhupada said the money will create poverty. Amazingly, it'll create poverty. Money will create poverty if not used in Krishna's service. That's interesting. So we have some questions, I think. So I'm going to go back and read. Do we have questions? 
Is that true? I thought some popped up. I just have to find where they start. Does it start with Gora Priya, Tanya? Is that the first question or comment? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Gora Priya says, appreciating something immediately implies that we are attached to it, or we can appreciate the beauty of something without implying that we are attached. Yeah. One or the other. Don't, no, you can appreciate something. I can appreciate so many things, but it doesn't mean that that appreciation makes me think that I'm God and that, and that is for my enjoyment. Like you might go to the store and you find a product and you say, well, this product is amazing. I really appreciate this. I could use this. Or I appreciate the intelligence or the creativity of the person who created it. Well, this would be perfect. I could use this in Krishna's service. So no problem. It's the mentality. Oh, this, this, I can use this to expand my enjoyment of this body. That's when we're in trouble. Because we're trying to purify ourselves of that. Right? That's where the problem comes. Just like we say with humility. It doesn't mean you can't appreciate, oh, I did something well. Krishna empowered me. Humility means to understand where that came from. So yes, I can appreciate that something was done well. As long as I appreciate that that power was given by Krishna's mercy. And as long as I appreciate that, it doesn't mean that I'm better than anybody. So, you know, we, we make assumption that if you appreciate something, or if you feel proud of something, or you acknowledge something is beautiful, then the ramification is it's going to entangle you. But that's only because of the way you're looking at it. If you're looking at it another way, it's not a problem. Right? Oh, I gave a great lecture today. Proud of myself. Yes, Krishna, thank you. You've empowered me. I can do more of this. I'm happy to serve you in this way. It doesn't make me think, well, I'm better than all the people who give lectures now. That propensity is already there. So giving the good lecture doesn't create that propensity. It's already there. Giving the good lecture could agitate that propensity, but it can't create it. Does that make sense? So if I don't have this bob that I want to compete with Krishna, I can appreciate so many things, but it doesn't arouse a desire to enjoy them independent of his service, just as I can do so many great things and I can acknowledge we were able to build this temple. We were able to start these programs. These programs are wonderful, but I don't think it's because I'm wonderful that I did it, that I'm special, that I'm special, especially I don't think that I'm better than others for doing it. Then it's natural to appreciate something. It's natural to feel some kind of pride Transcendental pride. Oh, I distributed 100 Bhagavad Gita today. I'm so proud of myself. I got out of bed, you know, and did it. I went out there, overcame my fears and lethargy. I did it. Yes. But not, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm the greatest gift to ISKCON now. That's when you run into trouble. I'm God's gift to ISKCON. And all you fallen souls, you know, you're very unfortunate that you're not God's gift to ISKCON like I am then you're in trouble. Not a little trouble, like major trouble, like birth and death kind of re-trouble. Rebirth and death, that kind of trouble. Okay, so. So what do we have here? We have more. Oh, we got lots. Adiyamani says, in Sri Chaitana Charitam Rita. Madhya Lord Chaitanya says that we should enjoy this world but not come attached to it. It's one of my favorite verses. You should not make yourself, by enjoy many means, be comfortable. You should not make yourself a show bottle devotee and become a false renunciant. For the time being, enjoy the material world in a befitting way. That means according to what you need. And do not become attached to it. In your heart, you should keep yourself very faithful, but externally, you may behave like an ordinary man. This Krishna will soon be very pleased and deliver you from Kachasmai. That was to Raghunath Das Goswami, right? 
In other words, Raghunath Swami is like he was like super wealthy and Mahaprabhu was saying, just take it, you know, Krishna is giving this to you, just live like this for now. This is what you need to do. And the time will come for your renunciation when you're ready. Of course, Raghunathi Daskoswami is eternally liberated, so he's always ready to be renounced. He already is. But he said in an example that sometimes we want to renounce and we're not ready. So, no. Um, Krishna has given you some facility. Use it. Be comfortable. Use it in his service. And this will produce, um, this will fulfill your needs. And then you can actually renounce without becoming a renouncing and then going back to non-renouncing, you know, like we say, Varnashram backwards, you know, sannyasi at 20, married at 40. Varnapras at 50. So when we say enjoy, we have to establish this idea, enjoy, but never think you're the enjoyer. Then it's okay. You know, have a nice house, nice wife, nice children, nice car, nice this, nice that. I'm enjoying, but I never think I'm the enjoyer. I'm enjoying the comforts of these things. These things have come by nature's arrangement. I'm not working 12 hours a day to get these things so that I will be happy, but somehow by nature's arrangement, I'm working and these things have been given to me. So Krishna's kind, he's allowing me to live comfortably, but I don't think I'm the enjoyer. And with that mentality, it'll be very easy in your older years to renounce because like I say, you've eaten all of all your life, now you can give it up. And someone might say, but if you've eaten all of all your life, how will you ever give it up? Because you get sick of it after a while, because it's just all of us, not like, you know, it's not like the Holy Name or the Bhagavatam or, you know, taking care of your deities. It's just all of us. It's like, it's not such a big thing. You've had like, you know, 4,376 scoops of all of us. By this time, you should be able to let it go, right? And it only takes 12 years, so let's say 365 days a year to get 4,000 scoops. How many years is that? It's only like 12, 13 years, 13, probably 13 years, you'll get four, no, let's say, okay, 4,000, 300 scoops, it'll take you 14 years. And that's not that long. So after 14 years of halava, it's like, okay, I can live without halava. So you enjoyed it, it's prasadam, but you never thought you were the enjoyer. You just, it satisfied you. And then at some point it's like, okay, I'm 56 years old, been there, done that, okay. Naturally, I don't really care anymore. And when it's natural, that's how you renounce. You can't renounce if it's not natural, right? I mean, you can try. You have to renounce something, sinful activity. <clears throat> but higher levels of renunciation have to be due to realization and experience. And sometimes, it, like I had a godbrother who had cancer, and they gave him a medicine that held the cancer back. But they said it only holds it back for two years. And so what that allows you to do is look for alternative remedies in the next two years, because it because it's not going to get any worse. And so, because if you look for alternative remedies, sometimes you die while you're looking. So, you know, we're enjoying, but the cancer of material life, it's not getting any worse. Krishna's allowing us to purify ourselves, right? And enjoyment is such a relative thing, right? You know, right? You come to my house, you look at it, and my house is just like an ordinary house in America. But if you fly in from India, look at my house, you'd be like, wow, this is really nice. We don't see anything like this in India. And I'm like, no, it's nothing. It's just like it was a house. So it's also relative, right, to how you process it. And then you go to the house of a wealthy person who's been wealthy all their life, and it's like, double, triple wow. And for him, it's like, ah, I've lived this, this is nothing. It's just normal for me. So he, he doesn't think he's an enjoyer. He just thinks, well, this is what I need to be comfortable. Right? It's just comfort, you know. I need a Maserati to be comfortable. You know, what can I say? No, we wouldn't preach that. But you know what I'm saying. 
but Maseratis are comfortable. I drove in one once in China. That was the highlight of my trip to China. <laughs> Tanya says, how do we purify those subtle desires for enjoyment without becoming frustrated? Just enough halava to not get you sick and just enough to fill you up and just enough so someday you can give it up. There's a threshold there. You know, there's a, it's like right here. Just stay within that. You know, if you go up here, you're going to fall. If you go down here, you're going to too much renunciation, too much enjoyment. It's all balance. As the Buddha say, the middle road. Kamal says, as long as our material desires are not spiritualized, the tendency to enjoy shall always be there. How to save yourself from such tendencies? Because you're not the enjoyer. That's it. And you're trying to love Krishna. Let's hear what Bhakti Siddhanta said. You just try to love Krishna. How can you be an enjoyer and love him at the same time? Just think. I exist to love Krishna. It's the most beautiful thought you could ever have. It solves this whole problem. We should see this material world and everything in it as full of ingredients for the Lord's service. Everything in this world is meant for Krishna's service. The day when we look at the world like this and become liberated from the material conception, we will be able to see this material world as a spiritual world, Goloka. We should treat all women as Krishna's beloved ones. They are... They are to be enjoyed by him. They are meant to be enjoyed by Krishna, never by the living entities. There it is. How do you, what about all the material things and stuff that I'm good at? Keep doing it for Krishna. Don't deny it. Offer all to Krishna gifts he has given us. Yes. Mayuresh. How do we as Grihasas understand that my wife actually belongs to Krishna and not having any mentality? Because just like you offer food to Krishna, you only eat it after she is boga for Krishna's service. For her, isn't Grihasta Ashram for those who cannot become a brahmacharya? <laughs> That's not really a healthy way to. I married you because I couldn't be a brahmacharya, otherwise, I hate you pretty much. No, you can't do that. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> if I could have been a brahmacharya, I never would have married you. I don't even like you. The you know? only reason I like you is because I'm lusty. You know? No, we don't want it. That's totally dysfunctional. It's a realization that this is what I need, and then you develop affection. And your affection for your wife is shown in how you help her engage in Christian service and serve her and don't see her as an object of your enjoyment, which the point I'm making is that's not easy because that's how we've been thinking for like 10 zillion lifetimes. So it's kind of natural, not kind of, it's totally natural. And we're trying to reprogram that. By thinking, my whole life is existing to give Krishna pleasure. That's it. I ex he loves me, and I exist to love him. And everything in this world is for him. And anything that I take from him, I'm, I'm stealing, including my wife. Right? Krishna had 16,108 wives. He's letting you have one, but she's his. And he's, you have her on lease, so take care of her. That's all I can say. Hare Krishna. Okay. On that happy note, we're going to chant Japa so we can manifest our love for Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.